Hello, I'm Sarah Soleimani. I'm an actress and writer. So my journey in theatre started quite young. When I was 15, I auditioned for the National Youth Theatre and uh, I got in and uh, it was the summer that sort of changed my life really. I'd um, just lost my mum to cancer um, a few weeks before I got the letter saying I, I, I would get in. And that summer I was really a grieving child, but like most children who go through a trauma, I didn't realize it at the time. It was, um, it was the most transformative summer of my life because I was suddenly with people creating a show and we did a lot of devised work. It was with Paul Roseby, who's now the artistic director of the National Youth Theatre. And we would make these plays, um, which we did for just two seasons and put them on in front of a live, before, uh, live audience. And nothing quite prepared me for what it would feel like to spend every single day in a company. Um, what I learned about punctuality and being on time and respect um, and creating, creating something. And so much of when you're a kid is, you know, it, it, time feels quite long, quite boring and you're waiting for, I seem to wait for buses a lot of my life, took about six buses a day to get to school classes you had to listen you had to study you had to revise suddenly I was in this space where time just zapped by and I was focused on creating this piece um the thing that Paul Roseby taught us which has always stayed with me was serving truth truth of the moment truth of how to drink a cup of tea authentically truth on how to be scratched in the face we did a lot of um, uh, stage fighting which I everyone loved but also truth about bigger things, bigger issues, bigger dilemmas, bigger stories. And that space when you're a child, um, when you're away from the market, when you're not about selling, um, when you're not about career, uh, now I'm in Hollywood, um, I can see that that set me up for a lifelong dedication to figuring out the truth and trying to present the truth to an audience. Um, and it's only now, I'm 38 now, I live in LA and I'm a TV writer, that I've realized my whole voice was shaped by British theater. After National Youth Theater, I did absolutely every new writing course I could get my hands on. I did the Royal Court Young Writers, I did the Old Vic New Voices, the Old Vic took us to New York, we put our play on, at the play, our plays on at the Public Theater New York. I did the Young Vic, um, the National, obviously, um, the uh, Etc. Theatre in Camden, the 503, always writing pieces, plays, and, and realising that the only thing that mattered, and David Mamet talks about this, is the verdict of a paying audience. Because your parents and your family can tell you you're brilliant, but until you're seeing your work, in front of a live audience, you don't really have a gauge of how it's going down. And I remember one play I wrote, I was crying my eyes out, I was so moved. And I turned around and half the audience had left and the ones that were remaining were asleep. And it was a big moment for me when I was like, I need to do some work on figuring out how to get what I feel so they can feel it too. And the other thing about this new writing scene, which I didn't even realize I was a part of, you just think you're trying to get somewhere and you're writing all the time, but actually it was this scene. Phoebe Waller-Bridge had this company called Dry Write. We used to write little pieces for them. Everyone had a theater company. Michael Longhurst and I would do pieces together, who's now the director of the Donma. We were all just working, working. And one of the best things about it was that we would put on our plays um, alongside each other. So you saw other writers being more effective than you. And yes, there was a, an element of competitiveness because I'm a comp competitive person, but it was also really informative and like, how are they connecting to that audience? What are they doing? What are they not saying? What tricks are they using? So over a decade, um, you develop a voice and you develop your strengths as a writer certainly for me and a performer as well. Um, and when you when I come to America, 
and I'm working alongside a lot of other writers and it's really interesting seeing how they come up because there's really not the same public funded theatre that we have in the UK and they very few have had productions put on and uh, so their their contribution in the writer's room is often about impressing a showrunner or, or selling themselves, selling a pitch, selling an idea. And the thing that was most valuable to me, which I now absolutely cherish and didn't realise at the time, was that I was part of a company where together we were working to serve the audience, to serve a story about something that mattered, something that was truthful, but also something that was very entertaining. And now looking back, I can realise that was this great gift that I was given. So what's nice about being a performer is that you get to experience different mediums. I've done everything from being in a theatre above a pub to doing webisodes online to doing TV and film. And sometimes you worry about how your performance should uh, be moulded for the medium that you're working in. Um, my advice would be not to worry too much. Um, there are practical technical things that you have to think about. Obviously, if you're doing a webisode or you're doing uh, you're doing something to, to camera, you know where the camera is and you, you can use very small mo movements to indicate what's happening, maybe off screen. And if you're in a larger space, you just have to take um, notice of the volume um, and, and your projection and how well you can be, be heard and the clarity of how you speak. And that I would advise just to, to trust the people around you who are directing you and uh, uh, helping you facilitate that space. The, the truth is, whether you're doing the smallest room in the world or the biggest stage in the world, the core of your performance and the, the things that you're, that, that you're playing and the, the connection you have with the other actors on stage, if there are, or the material, if, it's, if you're on your own, that stays the same. And that's the beauty of it, really. It stays the same. The, the intensity of your performance will read um, as long as people can hear you and understand what you're saying. So, so I would trust that if you've done the work in preparing your performance and understanding your character and understanding what you're trying to do to the other person, keeping it active and alive, um, then you shouldn't worry about uh, changing the space. The truth is nothing should stop you from creating. And even if you don't feel like you're a writer, you feel like you're a performer, you can read, you can um, read plays, you can read monologues, you can learn a monologue, you can learn poetry, you can, you can write something for yourself. And the most important thing is to keep going. The, the circumstances will never be perfect. Even if you're in a production, you'll wish you had more time, you wish you had more this, more that. Don't wait for everything to be perfect to begin. You are an artist, you are a performer, you need to start doing it. A little thing, every single day. And when you look back, you realize you've actually got a, a good body of work behind you. So to anyone who is participating in Connections, um, I'm wishing you all the love and all the luck in the world. And I hope you have a great experience. My advice would be enjoy it. Enjoy being in this company. Enjoy being a part of this incredible theater that means so much to the country and has done such incredible work. You are now a part of it and you'll have that for the rest of your life. As well as being a performer, you are now an activist for theatre. So you make, make sure that you fight for it and make sure that your voice is heard.